uh, tonight we are in, of course, uh, the book of Genesis in our verse-by-verse -verse study, chapter-by-chapter. Chapter. We're in Genesis chapter number 23. Last week we concluded Genesis chapter number 22, one of the most famous stories in the entire Bible where Abraham is tried by God to go and offer Isaac as a sacrifice, of course. Now we're going to pick up here in Genesis chapter number 23, verse number 1. This is the next milestone in Abraham's life. Look there in verse number 1, it says this. And Sarah was in 107 and 20 years old. These were the years of the life of Sarah. Of course, that's another way of saying that, that Sarah passed away. Sarah is deceased, saying this is the total of her years. Verse 2. And Sarah died in Kirjath Arba. The same is Hebron in the land of Canaan. Now you keep seeing that brought up repeatedly. I know when uh, Kirjath Arba was, was mentioned or alluded to prior to this, I actually turned you to this verse. This is a good verse to keep in mind so that you can identify different locations in the Bible. That's good to do. And this is a good one for specifically what is Kirjath Arba. You know, Arba, of course, is a man that was named after, but Kirjath Arba is a location, and it's specifically Hebron. More people are familiar with Hebron. Many, uh, you know, uh, uh, profound things happened in the city of Hebron. So that's where this is located. Look at what it says next. And Abraham came to mourn for Sarah and to weep for her. And Abraham stood up from before his dead and spake unto the sons of Heth, saying. So we can see that Abraham is very sad. It says that he came at the end of verse 2 to mourn for Sarah and to weep for her. Now you're going to see the great humility again. And I've stressed that about Abraham in a lot of different ways. But even more so, you're going to see Abraham's uh, humility uh, emphasized in this particular chapter. And of course, uh, you know, some things can humble you more so, can even bring you, even if you're a humble man in your life, if you have something, you know, traumatic that happens to you, you can have events humble you. Even prideful people can have events take place in their life, and it will bring them, them to a place of humility. But of course, even a humble man can be humbled even more so. And that's what happens here, I believe. Look at what it says in verse number four. I am a stranger and a sojourner with you. So strangers like four. Give me a possession of a burying place with you, that I may bury my dead out of my sight. Verse 5. And the children of Heth answered Abraham, saying unto him, Hear us, my Lord, thou art a mighty prince among us. In the choice of our sepulchres, bury thy dead. None of us shall withhold from thee his sepulchre, but that thou mayest bury thy dead. I want you to turn to Genesis chapter 26, verse 46. Actually, 27, sorry. Genesis 27, 46. Genesis chapter 27, look at verse number 46. This is the story uh, between the dispute of Isaac and Esau. And I want you to look there at the end when Isaac is running, he's leaving uh, after he received or he supplanted Esau's uh, blessing. I want you to look here at verse number 46. It says this, And Rebekah said to Isaac, I am weary of my life because of the daughters of Heth. Now that's who we were just reading about, the children of Heth, right? It says the daughters of Heth. If Jacob take a wife of the daughters of Heth, such as these which are of the daughters of the land, what good shall my life do me. Go back to Genesis chapter number 23 with that in mind. Now, I want you to notice there, does it sound like from Rebecca's perspective, uh, that is Isaac's wife, of course, does it sound like the children of Heth, or the children of this land, are good people? No, it sounds like they're bad people, right? She's, it, it, it's, it's causing sorrow of heart to her, even the thought of her child, her son, marrying these people. Why? Because they're heathens. Because why? Because they serve Isaac, Abraham, they serve the God of the Bible. They serve God Almighty, right? Which we'll give his name in Jehovah later, the one true God, right? They're Christians before Christ came. Of course, they're, they're, they're trusting in the seed or the, the Messiah to come. And she obviously looks at the, the children of Heth, which is the children of Canaan, which are, of course, very wicked. And she says, I don't want my, my ch child to marry any of the daughters of Heth. You know, that, that, that hurt her heart, that, that caused sorrow to her. So when we come here and we're reading about the children of Heth, what type of people are they? They're wicked, heathen people is the perfect way to describe it. They're heathen people, aren't they? They don't serve the God of the Bible. They're pagans. They, they serve their own God. Normally, you know, they would serve a multiplicity of gods. All of those that are heathens or pagans in the Bible. 
So that's the types of people that you have Abraham coming to here. Now, I, I want to make a, a point here of uh, application modern day to you yourself. I want you to read verse number 6 one more time and see what it says. And I want you to keep in mind this is Abraham coming to the heathen. And look at what it says. Verse 5, actually, uh, uh, first. Actually, let's begin. Let's, let's just back up. Wipe that out. What I just said, I want to begin in verse 4. It's Abraham speaking again. I am a stranger and a sojourner with you. Give me a possession of a burying place with you that I may bury my dead out of my sight. And the children of Heth answered Abraham, saying unto him, Hear us, my Lord. Now, how does that sound like they're speaking to him? In a very, very respectful way, isn't it? They say, Hear us, my Lord. That's like saying, My sir, like a boss. Thou art a mighty prince among us in the choice of our sepulchers. Bury thy dead. None of us shall withhold from thee his sepulchre, but that thou mayest bury thy dead. I want you to look at the relationship that Abraham has with the children of Heth. I find this very interesting. Number one, obviously, you can see that you know Abraham comes to them and he's very humble. Which he has something, he has great humility in his life. You can see many times prior to this that I've pointed out. But not only that, he has something traumatic that happened to him right now. And I'm sure that that, could, that in and of itself could humble you. Your, your, you know, your loved one that you're with for many, many years passes away. I'm sure that that would put you into a very state, a, a very much state of humility, a large state of humility, right? But not only that. It's interesting the way that the children of Het, the Canaanites, look at Abraham. How do they look at him? They have extreme respect, don't they? They look up to him. You know why? Because Abraham is a man of reputation. Now, this is an important application to our lives today of, uh, as being Christians, even today, of course. When we you know we're around one another, we come to church, right? We all get along perfectly. We're all on the same vibe, right? Everybody here, you know, believes the same. We all believe the same doctrine. We all believe the same book. We all love the same hymns. We all, you know, we we have core values that are all centered around one another. I think we all line up, right? We're all compatible, aren't we? So we all get along perfectly. But do think about this, dude. I spend. Do I spend the majority of time with you? I do not, do I? I spend more time with the people that I work with than I spend with you. Do you think about that ever? I spend more time, obviously, with my family, of course, than I spend with you. But I spend more time with secular people, people that are not Christians, people that are not, you know, believing on the Lord Jesus Christ, most of them, of course, than I spend with you. And it's very important. Now, people will downplay you know, or people will abuse, let me say, let me word it this way first. People will abuse, um, you know, having a reputation as far as, uh, um, you know, having a testimony. Let me, let me say that. People will abuse the importance of a testimony because they'll take it. Now, it's important to have a good testimony. But they'll take it to the point of, that's all that you need is just a testimony. Right. All you need is a testimony, and they'll just totally eliminate the idea of ever having to open your mouth and preach the gospel boldly to someone. It's because they're not bold is why. When anyone is right. too afraid to, to open their mouth, they're, they're ashamed of the Bible is what it is. They're ashamed of Christ is really what it is. But, but they'll take it so far as to, you know, you don't need to preach the gospel, just have a good testimony, right? Well, that's not right either. You need to have a good testimony so that when you go to preach the gospel, they're receptive. They're an open door to you, right? But, so both are, both are important. All of us as Christians, everyone in here today, you should not only have a good reputation, you should not only have a good report of the people that are in this building, you should have a good report, a good reputation of even the heathen. So your boss, wherever you work, is probably a heathen. He's probably, you know, some sort of, in some sense, I don't know if he's a Christian or not, but even if he is a Christian, he's probably a very liberal Christian. At the very least. He's probably maybe, uh, he might even be just a Catholic. He's not even really a Bible believer. You know, he thinks that he believes the Bible and things like that. But he doesn't really know what he believes. Right? You know, I would put those people in a category of just unsaved, the world, right? You shouldn't only have a good reputation of people in this building. It's good to have a good, it's easy to have a good reputation of the people in this building. That's very easy. I don't see you that often. Right? All you got to do is put on a tie. Brother Rick failed already there. No, I'm just kidding. I just thought that right while I was saying it. All you have to do is look nice and then come into the building for a, an hour or two, right? And, you know, quote a couple of scriptures, make it look like you at least have been reading your Bible for the week. You know what I mean? And then walk out the door. 
keep your family like, hey, while we're in there, everybody be good for an hour, right? And then out the door, go. It, it's not that hard, right? But you know what? When you're working daily, when you're when you're 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 all day, you know, laboring on a particular project, and people start getting frustrated, things change, don't they? It's not a controlled environment anymore. Things are totally different. Your next door neighbor, not just you know, speaking to the men when they go to work every day, but your next door neighbor it's for the whole family. I mean, you know, they're going to be looking at you. People are just nosy in general, but they're going to be they're going to see you. They're going to be looking at you. They're going to watch you. You know, you're going to bump into them. We should have a good report with them. They should say, hey, their children are very well behaved. They have very well they very well behaved children. When you go to the store, people should, you should be getting compliments. You know, your children are very well behaved. You have very well behaved children. You know, all of the different areas of life, your children are very well mannered. You know, these are the types of compliments that you'll hear very often, isn't it? You know, people will say to my wife, I'm sure you guys all hear the same thing, like, man, I haven't seen such well behaved children in so long. It's not, you don't have a lot of competition today, because everybody's, all the children are brats, but still, you know, we hear that all the time, I'm sure you guys do. We hear, my wife tells me all the time that people say that to her. Yeah, your kids are very well behaved, like they have to sit like and wait, you know, like at a dentistry or a doctor's office in some sort of contained environment. That we're lit. People are used to seeing the kids just like tear everything apart. But the kids are actually, you know, able to sit like this. It's because of this is why. This is one of the reasons why. Because they're, you know, they're, they're, uh, it's mandatory to stay in their seat, right? And to, and to pay attention. And that causes them to be well behaved in those areas. But we should have a good report of the world. It doesn't, it shouldn't only be in here. It's easy to look good for an hour. It's easy to come in here with your friends and people that you're close to, people you're already compatible to. You should have a good report with them that are without as well. I want you to go to 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 7. Go to 1 Timothy chapter number 3, verse number 7. Your company, all the men, the places that you work, your employer. Your employer should like you. Your employer, you should be one of the better employees at your company. You should be the, you should strive to be the best employee at your company. Yeah. You, your boss should not, you know, have to just, just stress about you getting something done or be worried like if he's giving you a particular project. Your boss should be looking forward to you taking over a certain project. Right? Your boss should be looking forward to, if he has somebody to get the job done, he should be thinking, I need somebody faithful, I'm going to get Anthony Fox. Or I need somebody to do this, I'm going to get Rick Martinez. That's the, that is the, you know, the attitude that, that those that you're working for, your masters, as the Bible would call them, should have when they think about you. That's the mentality. That's the type of mindset when they look at you, the perception that they should have of you. It, it doesn't only just end here. It's easy, as I said many times, to look good here for an hour. But when you go out in the world and you have to live your life day by day by day, and they see you every day, you know what? They start really getting to know your true character. They start really getting to see you, you know, when, when, when the grind occurs, when things, you know, you got to stay late or something like that or whatever's going on. Or, hey, I need you to come in and work extra hours here. Hey, I need you to do this over here. You've maybe never done that before. You know, when they see you every day and you got to come in to work and, hey, you got a specific time that you have to show up every day, that's different, isn't it? Every day throughout the whole week. These are all important characters. These are all things that, that show your character is what they are. We should be men and women of integrity. We should have integrity. And even when we go to the heathen, they should say, Hello, my Lord, right? They should have respect to you. They should think, hey, you're a mighty prince. You know, of our company, you are one of the best workers at our company. Amen. At our company, you're one of the guys that if I had to get, it, get somebody to do a job, I want you to do it. I want to make sure you do it. Look at 1 Timothy chapter number 3. This is actually the uh, requirements or the qualifications in order to be a bishop, or as we would refer to it as a pastor. Look at verse number 7. It says this. Moreover, he must have a good report of them which are without. And then it says, lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. Now notice what it says. This is a qualification to be a pastor. Moreover, he must have a good report of them which are without. So in order to be a pastor or in order to be a bishop, it is a qualification. It is a qualification to have a good report of them which are without. That means this. I'll give you an example. Let's say Brother Elliot. Now, this is t 
totally hypothetical. I'm not getting sent any, you know, uh, hidden messages or anything. Let's say Brother Elliot wants to be sent out in, in, you know, a year, two years, three years, however long, right? And then we're talking about it, and I'm getting ready to send him out, and then his boss calls me. And his boss is like, hey, does, you know, uh, Mr. Ray attend your church? And I'm like, yeah. And then he's like, hey, I just wanted to let you know, you know. And he just goes on down this big, bad report, just to make it in words of simplicity. You know, just the exact opposite of this. Just this is how he's been working, and he's a good guy, but I'm thinking about firing him or something like that. Let's say that that happened about Brother Martinez. Anyone, right? I don't want to just make people think like that. <laughs> Let's say that happened with Brother Martinez, that he wanted to go to be a pastor. And, it's, and I'm telling you this right now, I wouldn't send them out. That is a perfect example of not having a good report of them, which I'll be telling you. That is a perfect example of that, of, of not having a good report of them, which I'll be telling you. If you. Every company that you work for, obviously myself, that nut job in Arizona, this wouldn't work for, but every company that you've ever worked for, you should be able to go and get your job back at any moment. If there was availability and things like that. Seriously. There should never be anything that they look back and they're like, man, I don't know if I want to hire that guy back. He was good, but, you know, he did this all right, but that's not, that is not, you know, the expectations of a Christian. You shouldn't be just a mediocre employee. Amen. As a Christian, you should be standing out. When you look at Daniel and you look at the three wise men, they're talked about as excelling in all areas. When they needed something to be done, when, when, when uh, Nebuchadnezzar, you know, uh, has, has his dream and all of that, everyone was well aware, like, you need to go to Daniel. You know why? Because he had, you know, a, a wisdom that other people didn't have. You know, because he, why? Because the Lord was with him. That's how you need to be in your work, everything you do. The Bible talks about that anything that your hand finds, you need to do it with all your might. Every work that you do, every day when you go to work, and whether you're working at the house or you're working, you know, whether men are working on the project, whether they're working just their daily tasks at the house, whether men are going to work, whether you're doing work here, I don't care what you're doing. Everything that you do, you should do it under Christ, the Bible says. Everything. It should be like Jesus is there standing there as your boss. Don't you think that that would make you work a little bit better? Don't you think that you would, you know, whatever the task is, if you're cleaning the floor or anything like that, and Jesus was just standing there like this, you'd be like, I'm going to get everything off this floor. I'm going to shine this floor like it's never been shined. Wouldn't you act that way? Seriously. You, yeah. Wouldn't that be the way you want? That's the way you should be anyway. Anyways, that's what the Bible says. Every work that you do, you should do it as under Christ. Every, whatever your hand finds to do, you should do it with all your might. Anything. If you're doing a project at the house, whatever it is, I don't care whatever it is, anything, everything, whatever, if your hand is touching it, you should do everything. Somebody go get that. I know everybody's dying to get it. If you want to get it, I saw like three people. <laughs> I thought it was the kids, though, but <laughs> whatever your hand finds to get, to work, to, to do, whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might. It, was, it just kept spinning is why I said that. Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might. Whatever it may be, work as absolutely as hard as you possibly can. Amen. And whatever you do, be a hard worker. Don't be lazy. Don't be lazy. Work Amen. hard. Be diligent, too. That's also what I think of. Those are the two things that I think of when I read that verse in Ecclesiastes. I'm not, I'm not quoting it verbatim. But when I read that verse in Ecclesiastes, it, it causes me to think of two things. It causes me to think of hard work and then also diligence. There's a difference between the two. Hard work is just like, is, is, is you just pushing until the end, right? It's just working, 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 even when things get hard, right? You're doing the work even when it's hard. You just keep working. You're going to get the job done. You work until it's done. You don't be, you're not lazy while you're working. You have a good work ethic. But not only that, there's diligence, and that's important. Diligence. And diligence is doing a thorough job. It's being thorough at your work. It's, it's, you know, and this is something especially that children struggle with. Children, this is an area where children are really poor at, at, in their life. They may develop a, a, a good work ethic early on, but normally if you give them a task where they'll fail is their thoroughness or their, their diligence. They won't be diligent enough. Let's say that you have them sweep the floor or something, just menial tasks like that. They won't, they won't get everything, will they? 
Now, they may work until it's done. They may even be ready to do more, right? But they're just not thorough. That's important. When you do something, don't have somebody else to go back behind you. Check your own work. You have a good reputation. Check your, make sure when you're doing something that you're paying close attention to whatever it is, whatever you're working on. Try to make it the, as good as you can possibly have it, the best that it can possibly be, right? Care what people think about you in the sense that you are a minister of Christ. You are, you know, the Bible talks about us being ambassadors of Christ. You know, we are, we, we represent the Lord Jesus Christ, don't we? So think of, you need to keep that in mind when maybe you are starting to slack at your job. Not only do you represent, obviously that's the most important thing, but you also represent our church here. You know, representing Jesus is what you should be worried about way farther before you value Baptist church. But still, think that, keep that in mind too. We want this church to grow. Our church wants to have a good reputation. We don't want to have the reputation of, man, you know, I had, you know, uh, Russell Bobs work for me. I, this is fun naming people. I had Russell Bobs work for me a few years ago, and he went to Value Baptist Church. So I'm not hiring that other guy, Josh Hall. I gotta get everybody right. I'm not hiring that other Hall, that other guy, Josh Hall, because obviously, apparently, Value Baptist Church. You know, this is just where you know. Poor quality people come from. Got people that don't have integrity or don't have values or character, right? Even the heathen looked at Abraham and they said, You're a mighty prince among us. E e these, are, these are heathen people that, you know, I, uh, you know um, Rebecca is like, I don't want my child marrying them. These are heathen, these are wicked men, but they still even said, You know, he's a mighty prince. And they had respect to him. Go back to Genesis chapter 23. Genesis chapter number 23. We'll continue reading. Again there, uh, we'll, we'll begin in verse 7. We read that once before. We're going to read it again now. I want, want you to keep in mind here in the next couple of verses the humility of Abraham. And Abraham stood up and bowed himself to the people of the land. Even to the children of Heth. You know what that means, even to the children of Heth? It's emphasizing. Kind of like it's not what is the norm. You understand what I'm saying? Even to the, like, that's kind of, you know, you're kind of surprised by that as the point that the Bible's making. So he stood up and he bowed himself. So he, he, uh, he was being, he showed humility again, right? He's showing uh, great humility to them. It says, even to the children of Heth. Now, I want you to listen to the way that he speaks as well. And he communed with them, saying, If it be your mind that I should bury my dead out of my sight, hear me, and entreat for me to Ephron, the son of Zohar. So notice how he's like, If it be your mind that I should do this and do that. So notice how he doesn't come in there. And they view him as being a mighty prince. Abraham was a man of great wealth. I don't know if you, you kind of can forget about that, but he was a man of great, great wealth. You know, when he comes in here, I mean, he's probably the most powerful person of everyone that he's speaking to right now. If you think about that. And he comes in there and listen, and look at the way that he, you know, uh, 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 behaves himself. And the way that he puts himself forth. He doesn't come in there just like uh, flaunting this or flaunting that. He comes in there with great humility, doesn't he? And then he says to him, if it be your mind, that I should bury my dad out of my sight here. He doesn't come in there and say, hey, I'm buying that, that land. Give me that, right? You know, we need to know how to be a base and, and, to, be a, and, and to humble ourselves, right? You know, the, Paul said that. Go to Philippians uh, two or 4, actually. We'll read that real quick. Genesis chapter number 3, 23. I'm going to make a quick point about this. Um, 
this is on my mind. This is a perfect example here, but let me give you an application in your life that's also related to like working and things like that. You know, if, if you start a new career, let's say that you're brand new at a career, you have, you're totally green as people would say it. You have zero background, zero experience, and you're stepping into this new field, just fresh meat, right? You get in there, do you think that you should be, you know, you know, high and mighty the first day and telling people, oh, I know how to do that, I know how to do this. Yeah, I've done that before and this other day. It's basically, no, you shouldn't be doing this. Should you? How should you be? You should be very humble. Should you? you should be going in there. You know, when you're speaking to someone about a subject of their expertise, you know, and you have never touched whatever he works on constantly, or you've never done whatever he does, but you've read like an article on it one day. You think you need to be like putting yourself forth as an export expert. If you've watched a YouTube video on something, but this guy does this daily for his work, should you be telling him how to do it? People are like this, and we should not be. You need to know when to be abased in a sense, right? He's obviously you know using a play on words when he says that. He knows when, like, you could say this, he knows when he's the boss and when he's not, right? He knows when he calls the shots and when he doesn't. That's what Paul means by that, right? But then he also knows, he knows when to be, when to, uh, not a base, but a bound. That's what he means by a bound. A base obviously means to be brought low. He knows when to be humble in, in, in the sense of when he needs to humble himself before someone else. But then he also knows, Paul knows, when he's speaking to people that maybe a church that he started. Right? Or when he's going somewhere, maybe someone that he's trained, or maybe his protege, his pupil. If he's talking to Timothy or Titus, he's going to talk to them different than, differently than when he talks to Peter, isn't he? So this is an important um, you know, moderation that you need to have in your life. You know why it can get you in trouble is, is maybe at work, man, if you try to talk to your you know, helper the same way that you talk to your boss, do you think that's going to work out well? No. There, there's different areas. Like uh, my dad said that he used an example one night in Bible study, and he kind of taught on this at, at his church. He was at that time, you know, he's the pastor of the church, so when he comes to the church, what is he? He's the ruler of the church, right? So he calls the shots at the church. He's like, but you know, at, for, for like a, a period of time, my, my, so my mom cleans for a living. She just does, she has like her own company, she just cleans, okay? Well, she needed like an extra helper to clean for a certain amount of time on a certain job. And... The person that was going to be doing it wasn't able to come anymore. They weren't able to have anybody come. And like the next day was coming. It was like for two to three weeks. So my dad went there and had to clean for that period of time. So he was explaining how I'm like basically a janitor. I'm doing like janitorial work, which people look down on that, but there's nothing wrong with that, right? It's a living just like anything else. It's not. It's just people's perception. That's why I'm using it as an example. And that's why he used it. You know, people's perception of that is like, ah, that's kind of like the garbage man. You know, even though they make like $20 an hour, and you got to do that. Did you guys, did people know that? Yeah. yeah, they make good, good money, real good money. I guess because they're smelling garbage all day. I don't know why they do that, but either way, but yeah, but they, so he's like a janitor, like during these two, three weeks, like four nights out of the week, but then he goes to the church and he's like a boss. He's the boss there. How do you think people are, would, would treat him? While he's like on his hands and knees scrubbing the floor. Hello, sir, mighty prince among us. No, of course not, right? No, but the, how do you think they treat him when he walks into the church? You see, do you understand what I'm saying? There, you, we have different areas of life, of our own lives. So we'll have different, different segments of our own lives. And we'll have sometimes an area where we're not the boss anymore, right? I'm, I, I'm like, a, a, like an on-site supervisor. For my company, and I've been in, 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 in like management for like the past probably six years or so since I've been in this industry. Uh, I've been in this industry for ten years, but for about six years since I've been in this industry. And, but I, but here's the thing: I, I have helpers and stuff that are assigned to me, and I'm their boss when they're there. But when I go into my shop and all the project managers are in there, and the owner is in there, and he says hi to me, and we engage in conversation, you know, you need to know when do uh, be a base and when to a bow. You need to know situations on how to speak to people in more of a humble way when you're not the boss. And if you don't master that, you will, you will not have a successful life, really. 
And there's a lot of people, whether or not you feel like this is a skill that you acquired many years ago, there's a lot of people that can't do this. There's a lot of people that I've had that come on that will maybe be a helper of mine, and they've never touched cable in their life, but they are going to wire up like a NASA ship or something, you know, that day. That, that kind of stuff, and pe really, and they're trying, like, immediately to tell you how to do your job. You know, that is, you know, that's not a biblical principle either. The Bible makes logical sense in the steps that it, it lays out for you in the way in which you should live your life. It's the recipe for a successful life. You're, 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 the Bible is the guide to having a successful life in all areas. So this is how you will have successful relationships with people, knowing your place. Whether or not you're the boss, whether or not you're not the boss, you know, whether or not you're talking about a subject that you know anything about or you don't, you need to know when to abound and when to be abased. It's an important thing. And even here... Abraham comes to them, and what does he need? He has a need from them, doesn't he? What do you think would happen if he came in there like, hey, that field, I want it. I'm Abraham, you know? I have however much money I need to buy that. You know, give it to me. I'm not going to accept no. It'd be like, not happening. Get out of here, right? See, he came in their house, humble, with humility. He's coming to their property, to their land. He's coming to the children of Heth, to all of their families assembled together. You know how he comes in? In a situation like that, how should you come in? If you visit another church, how should you act? You can act the same way you act here? Of course not. You should go in there very humbly, shouldn't you? More so, right? You should always be humble, but you understand what I'm saying? Even more so. You don't go in there and you don't call the shots. You don't make decisions on how things are going to be done. Like, hey, we don't use those hymnals here. Use this. Get right? You don't do things like that, right? You need to know when, in what situations to abound and what situations to abase. That is an important key to life. It really, truly is. You need to know your place in life and wherever you're at in that particular uh, you know, uh, time or whatever it is, situation. Go back to Genesis chapter number 23. Genesis chapter number 23, look at verse number 9. It says that he may give me the cave of, cave of Mechpelah, which he packed, which is in the end of his field for as much money as it, it, as it is worth, he shall give it me. For a possession of a burying place amongst you. Notice that he's doing good business with him. He's like, however much it's worth, that's the amount of money that I'm going to give you. So he says, whatever you know, whatever you say, that's how much I'm going to pay you, right? Look at uh, look at verse number ten. We just read verse nine, right? Yeah. Look at verse ten. And Ephron dwelt among the children of Heth. And Ephron the Hittite answered Abraham in the audience, so everyone can hear him. Is what that means. Of the children of Heth, even of all that went in at the gate of his city, saying, Nay, my lord. So notice the great respect that they're, they're continually showing to Abraham. Nay, my lord, hear me. The field give I thee, and the cave that is therein I give it thee. In the presence of the sons of my people give I it thee. Bury thy dead. And Abraham bowed down himself before the people of the land. Notice again, these are heathen. This, is, this would be like the world. This would be the people that are, are, are wicked, evil people, right? You know, in, in, in a sense, you know, I, I don't know these per, this particular group, but they're at least so far away from, you know, the God of the Bible where I, uh, um, Rebecca says, I don't want my children to marry into this, this family, right? And he bows down himself to the, to the people of the land. And he spake unto, uh, unto Ephron in the audience of the people of the land, saying, but if thou wilt give it, I pray thee, hear me. See, again, look at the humility. I will give thee money for the field. Take it of me, and I will bury my dead there. Just a quick point. We keep seeing them talk about burying, 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 right? Cremation is not a biblical practice. Cremation is not a biblical practice. You know, more and more Christians have the idea of cremation and, oh, it's inexpensive. That's what normally draws people to the option of cremation. It is not a biblical practice from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible. Every Christian is buried all throughout. You don't have people burning their, their loved ones in the Bible unless they're burning them under Molech. That's the only time you ever have, and that's obviously not a loved one in that case. But you don't have people burning their, their family members and then keeping the remains in some sort of base. That's, that is not a Christian practice. 
Christian practices vary repeatedly. And you can prove this all throughout the Bible. You know, when, and, and, uh, from the very beginning, you have it about Adam. You, from dust thou art, unto dust thou shalt return. And some people say, well, that's cremation. No. The book of Job, he talks about how though worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh shall I see God. So he's talking about how he knows, you know, he knows he has hope of the resurrection. And you know, even though my body's going to be destroyed, I'm still going to stand in the same body and look at it. You know, that's amazing that that doctrine is there so far away, right? Before it was revealed in clarity later in the New Testament. But still, he knew, he knew that, but uh, it's, my point is that He's going to be buried, and he was aware that his body, when he, when he died, they were going to put his body in the ground. What was going to happen? Worms. How could worms eat your flesh if you cremate? They couldn't, right? You know, burial, the reason why we bury the dead is because of the hope of the resurrection. That's the whole reason why we do that. That's the reason why people are buried in the first place. It's because we are one day going to be resurrected. That's why we're facing upward. Do you guys, has everyone, has everyone heard that before do that? That's why you're facing upward. It's because you're waiting as a Christian for Jesus to come back. That's the point of that, right? You know, and not only that, I know I mentioned this one time in the services, and I remember just about everybody said they hadn't heard of this before, but um, the, if you look at the United States of America, it's like 90% of the grave, of the headstones are actually facing east. And the reason is why. Jesus is coming back from the east. So you're laying down, and you're facing east, waiting for Jesus to come back. This is a representation of what you believe and who you are as a person. That's why we're not cremated. So if that represents the hope of resurrection going to heaven, what is cremation? What do they do? They take the body and they what? They burn it. So if there's two choices in the afterlife, one, and one form of preserving the body and laying the body down and having you face heaven and and wait for Jesus to come back from heaven. And then the other alternative method, method, they take the body and then they light it on fire. What does that represent? I don't want to be cremated. You better not. No, I'm just kidding. My wife wouldn't cremate me. So it's not a Christian. It's not a Christian practice. It's really not. It's not a Christian practice. People do it because it's inexpensive. Don't cremate. You need to be buried. It's for the hope of the resurrection. That's the reason why people do it. The reason why people all did it in the Bible. Look at uh, look there at verse number. What did we leave off? Verse number fourteen. Now, and Ephron answered Abraham, saying unto him, My Lord, hearken unto me. The land is worth four hundred shekels of silver. What is that betwixt me and thee? Bury therefore thy dead. And Abraham hearkened unto Ephron, and Abraham weighed to Ephron the silver which he had named in the audience of the sons of Heth. 400 shekels of silver, current money with the merchant. That's one of the reasons I'm sure why he had such a good reputation. He's a man of his word. He's a faithful man, wasn't he? He said, I'll pay you whatever you need for that. I don't want to, I don't want to, you know, jip you on it. Whatever it is, I'll give you the money. And then he says, okay, pay me this month, this amount of money. You know what he said? All right, I'll do it. And then he gave it to him. They know, more and more it's harder to find people that are good with their word. You know, and it, it takes very little now, even as time goes on, to stand out as a person with great character. You know, people, you know, and, and especially in our culture, is what I'm relating this to is it used to have more character. You know, even at your job, it takes less, you know, to even stand out as a great employee. You like show up on time, you work at seven o'clock, and you show up at seven o'clock every day, they're like, man. This guy is really a go-getter. I mean, he is getting employee of the month this month, right? That's the truth, you know? There is a guy in my company, I kid you not. This guy's been here for like 15 years, and he knows our work very well. He knows our industry, both the cabling, the infrastructure, the hardware, everything that I do, like, you know, the actual networking side, he knows this industry well. I've talked to him a lot. He's a smart guy. I'm building this up, all right? We start at 7 a.m. most days. He showed up yesterday at somebody's job site at 10.30 a.m. I'm not kidding you. Because he's been here for so long and knows what he's doing, he can do that. Now, obviously, everybody here should be like, that's ridiculous. Well, I know. But here, that's my point is this. If you hired somebody, obviously his skills and stuff outweigh the other aspect as well. I mean, you have to make a decision as a boss. It's worth it if I can find, can't find somebody you know, doing this and that or whatever. 
So you have to make your own decision that way. But if you hired somebody, you know, to work from 7 to 3, and somebody shows up at 10.30, I mean, good sakes. That's ridiculous, isn't it? 10.30, it's lunchtime in an hour. You're about to take a lunch break. Isn't that ridiculous? It's ridiculous. So all you would have to do to, to, to stand out if everybody did something like that, 8.30, 8, it's common for guys to be 35 minutes late sometimes. I mean, is, does it take a lot to stand out? No, it doesn't. So, again, back to having a good reputation. If you can't have a good re reputation, you know, it, it, at your job today, there's a problem because you don't have much competition. You really don't. You know, because our culture is going downhill, it makes it that much easier. So all you need to do is show up high, show up on time. You know, it used to be it's the battle for the best skills. You understand what I'm saying? It's like, hey, I want to be a welder. It's like everybody's showing up on time. Everybody's going there and working hard. Everybody is being diligent at their job. But then it, it, you know what it comes down to? Who have, whoever has the most natural skills, whoever's doing that at their home as well, and who's able to build the biggest talent in that area, that's going to be the best employee. It's not even that way anymore. Now you basically put in, you know, you, all you got to do is just show up on time, be faithful, not, you know, uh, steal from the company and rip people off and stuff like that, treat the client well, and, and you're getting bonuses and stuff. You know, it's not that hard to be a great worker, to be considered a great worker today. But you know what? You shouldn't be, this is a good example of when the Bible talks about how it's stupid to compare yourself among yourself, because you may have bad, you might be comparing yourself with people that are, you know, uh, of, of poor quality. But you should be, you should be, you shouldn't be even be worrying about that. You should be doing the best job anyways. And everything that you do. <clears throat> Verse 17. And the field of Ephron, which was in Mechpelah, which was before Mamre, the field and the cave which was therein, and all the trees that were in the field that were in all the borders round about were made sure. Unto Abraham for a possession in the presence of the children of Heth, before all that went in at the gate <coughs> of his city. <coughs> That's because it was made sure by the witnesses, right? <coughs> you understand that? Everyone heard it. Everyone heard it. So it was made sure in that way. It says in verse 19, <coughs> And after this, Abraham buried Sarah, his wife, in the cave of the field of Mechpelah, before Mamre. The same is Hebron in the land of Canaan. Now, um... I have a couple of references. We're not going to turn to them real quick. We're here at the end already. Uh, Genesis 25, 10, Genesis 49, 31, and Genesis 50, 13. If you're interested in looking those up, all that they are is the references of other people that were buried here. So we're going to be looking at them is why we're not going to turn to them right now. They're in the book of Genesis. Uh, you know, Abraham himself ended up being buried alongside his wife, Sarah. And then uh, Isaac and Rebekah ended up being buried in that exact same location. And then on top of that, Joseph was taken. That's the interesting one if you want to go to uh, 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 Genesis 50, 13 after the services or something, a little glance at it yourself. Joseph was taken to that location himself after his, when his bones were left and he died in Egypt. He knew, it says, by faith that he was going to be carried out and go to Canaan because he knew the promise was true. Of that his of his seed would possess that land that was given to Abraham. He knew someday that he would. He's taken there, and then actually all of that land, this land, is, it ends up being given to Joseph. It's of, of his tribe and his property. So once his bones are placed there. So that's the interesting one in Genesis 50, uh, 13. Uh, actually, Joshua, I'm sorry, Joshua 24, 32 is where you find out where that where that uh, lot, where that lot of land is appropriated to Joseph. That's where you find out where that land is actually given to Joseph. Genesis 50, 13 is where it talks about how Joseph's going to be buried there. So Joshua 24, 32 is where you find out that that land is going to be given to Joseph. Uh, verse 20 there, the last verse, it says, In the field and the cave that is therein were made sure unto Abraham for a possession of a burying place by the sons of Heth. So, small uh, point, I looked this up while I was reading this just moments before the service, maybe 30 minutes before the service, I, I, I like to reread it a few times beforehand, and that, that phrase, made sure, I was like, man, I don't think that that phrase is used a lot, because when I read it, a, you know, another verse will pop into your mind, does, does another verse pop into anybody's mind right now, made sure? It's in Matthew 27. Matthew 27, 64, where they talk about how they make the tomb sure. 
make it sure. And I was thinking, I think that this is only used like once or twice, but it's actually used right here in verse 17, verse 20, and then Matthew 27, 64. What's interesting is because this is talking about a cave as well. It's talking about the land. It's talking about a cave where he's going to be burying, where Abraham ends up being buried, Sarah ends up being buried, Isaac, Rebecca, Joseph, and I don't know if anybody else, but they're buried in a cave like Jesus was buried in a cave. And it's Pilate talking about how, or it's, it's when the, I believe the, the, the Jewish priests are the ones that say it, the Pharisees, when they come to Pilate and they say, hey, we remember this deceiver said that he was going to, he was going to be dead and after three days he's going to raise again, you know, and we want, you know, to make sure that nobody takes his body and lies about it, right? So then Pilate says, sends the guards and they make it sure. So it's interesting right here, like, it's made sure saying that it's talking about the cave and it's relative to the very similar subject. But when it's made sure here, you get a definition of made sure. Like everybody heard it, it's his. There's no way out of this. And then you think, well, the tomb was made sure that he wasn't going to come out. And then what popped in my mind was, you know, it's Jesus is winning that victory no matter what, basically. They thought they made the tomb sure. But there was no stopping him. It talks about how how he how even the uh, how is that worded? How even the uh, the uh, you guys know what I'm talking about? The bonds. How even the bonds couldn't hold him. You remember that? Yeah, there's a verse in the book of Acts that says something along the lines that says it was not possible that he should be holding of them. I can't remember the words that it, that was an exact quote right there. But it, uh, it, I can't remember what it's talking about, but uh, it's, something, it's like bonds. And it says, because it, before it was not possible that he should be holding of them, saying that he was going to raise from the dead no matter what. They, they, they can make that sure, that as sure as they think it is, that he was coming out of that tomb no matter what. Nothing was going to stop him. So it's good to get a definition of it when you see that it actually really does mean they made it sure. But hey, he was coming out of the tomb no matter what. Let's bow our eyes and have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, God, we thank you, dear Lord, for your word. We thank you for all the great examples. Uh, we thank you for, for giving us uh, so much of Abraham's life, which was one of the greatest examples, one of the greatest Christian men with integrity in the Bible. We ask you that you would help us to, to follow in his footsteps, to be, uh, have a good report of them which are without, dear Lord, to be hard workers um, uh, as men and also all the women, to be uh, uh, good examples unto unto their children, uh, all the men would be good examples, and their children as well. We ask you that you bless our church, be with us, and, uh, and guide us, dear Lord. And in Jesus Christ's name, amen. amen.